Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Atik Zabinski. And I'm Sarah Berman. Friday, September 28th is the opening date for the new Barclays Center Arena in Brooklyn, and activists are preparing a weekend of protest. The project, a work of developer Bruce Ratner, has been called the epitome of crony capitalism. The story of how it came to pass despite fierce resistance from the local community is a convoluted tale that reveals the extent of influence of big business in politics. Among the hundreds of people who lost their homes to make way for the development was designer Daniel Goldstein. In fighting for his home, Goldstein became an activist leader, founding the organization Develop, Don't Destroy. He is the leading figure in the acclaimed documentary The Battle for Brooklyn. We spoke with Goldstein at his new home in Park Slope. Uh, the Atlantic Yards project was a project proposed in 2003 by developer Forest City Ratner um, to build a basketball arena for the New Jersey Nets to move to Brooklyn and at the time 15 skyscrapers. Um, eventually the project was for 130 units of housing and a huge office tower 50 stories or so and the arena and the community where it was going to be built uh, is predominantly a low-rise residential community and the site that the developer Bruce Ratner handpicked with the permission of Governor Pataki at the time, Mayor Bloomberg, was um, happened to have residences on it um, and businesses. Um, a real mixed-use, uh, somewhat typical uh, Brooklyn neighborhood, uh, low-income to luxury condos, um, uh, light industry sort of neighborhood that was doing quite fine on its own and 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 you know gentrification coming in but uh at a slow pace as opposed to this uh, what uh, city councilman Charles Barron once uh, called instant gentrification that the project would bring and there was uh, roughly an eight-year fight that was led by a group that I co-founded called Develop Don't Destroy Brooklyn which over time built up a donor base of roughly 6,000 people because we had to go to court uh, to fight the use of eminent domain. The use of eminent domain uh, for this project we believed was unconstitutional. Eminent domain is supposed to be the government's uh, right to take, to seize private property um, for a public use. But over the past 50 years or so, um, uh, it's been used for bogus reasons, not for public use, although it has the, the facade of public use. So economic development has now become the, the justification for eminent domain. And economic development means a city, a town, whatever, um, is going to have new tax revenue uh, come in from whatever is built. Well, any pretty much anything that's built is going to create some, some new tax revenue. So as far, as far as I can tell, especially in New York State, um, eminent domain for, for um, can be justified if someone wants to propose to build anything because there'll be new tax revenue. So there was a fight that went on for uh, eight years with thousands of people involved, a core group like with any any movement like this of, of uh, volunteers who gave full time, part time, a lot of time over those years. Um, and the battle was fought mainly in, in, in the courts and agitating in the streets. Um, because the, the political uh, avenues to change or stop, or modify the project were, were closed from the beginning because the project, which is the largest project proposed in Brooklyn's history, bypassed New York City Council. It bypassed New York City's process to decide how to develop uh, its, its land. And in bypassing that, it became a state project and that meant that not a single elected official had a vote on the largest project in Brooklyn's history that would use an abuse eminent domain, would use hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars to subsidize a private arena and mostly luxury housing, to give away land for free, public land, city streets for free, to sell part of the site, which is a rail yard, um, to the developer well below market value through a fixed bidding process. So. This developer has now gained control to 22 acres where, in the, in, where at the crossroads of Brooklyn, where Flatbush and Atlantic meet, uh, through no bidding process. 
Uh, to me, what the project uh, stands for today, um, and today they held a ribbon cutting for the arena portion of the project, because that's all that's been built. Um, it, it's, it's the ultimate in crony capitalism. It's the ultimate in political cronyism. It's a monument to that. Um, there was no democratic process whatsoever in taking over a neighborhood and pushing people out of their homes and using massive amounts of taxpayer dollars. Um, that's the goal of groups like Developed on Destroy Brooklyn, a group called Brooklyn Speaks, many other community groups, to try to make a bad situation somehow better. And the goal, the ultimate goal would, goal would be to take away the control of the land that this developer has gotten and get him out of the picture because he, this developer and no developer really could develop this site in a timely fashion. So the goal is to take the vacant land that he's made vacant and bring in multiple developers to work with the community to expedite the construction of affordable housing and hopefully bring down the median, uh, the, the income bans that are used for the affordable housing section. The protests have already begun. On Friday, September 21st, as a press conference was called at Inside the Center, activists held a demonstration and counter-press conference outside. Further demonstrations will kick off on Thursday the 27th with a candlelit vigil. Actions will continue throughout the weekend and will include a free outdoor screening of the Battle for Brooklyn, a march organized by Families United for Racial and Economic Equality, or FURY, performances by the Guitar Me, and pop-up actions to be announced. For further information, visit aycrimescene.com or call 347-292-7460. A week has passed since S-17, the one-year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. A three-day weekend of celebrations, protests, and teach-ins was followed by four days of education with the Free University in Madison Square Park. As everyone in the movement began recovering from this marathon of activity, we wanted to hear what they thought of S-17 and its aftermath. We've convened a special panel discussion on the topic with a few people in the movement whose voices we think you ought to hear. Welcome to the inaugural Google Hangout of Occupy Public Access TV. Uh, my name is Harry Wastefren. I'm proud to be able to convene these fantastic Occupy organizers and reporters. Uh, just going down the line, first we have Atik Zavinsky, also of Occupy Public Access TV. You've probably seen him at whatever action you've been at with his camera covering stuff as well as he can. Uh, we also have Elizabeth Arce, who's a live streamer with Global Revolution Media. John Neffel, who is an independent journalist who's been covering the Occupy movement, who had a particularly unfortunate incident on S17 that we'll get into uh, very shortly. And then we have Samumba Sabukwe, who is an organizer with Acu, uh, Acu Evolve, and just an all-around great guy, supporter of the show. And I guess to start, uh, the main purpose of what we're trying to do here is that we had just had our one-year anniversary, S17, September 17th, and we're looking to have this show be a broad discussion of to what degree was F17 a victory or wasn't it? Uh, we had planned for months. And really, it's a question not only of the organizing that it went, went into it, but our capacity to spread the word of, about our victories and to learn from our lessons and the like. So to start, uh, Elizabeth, you're obviously a live streamer. Uh, what did you think about S17 and the ability to get these messages of victory or defeat out? Um, well, I feel weird about like doing an absolutes of success or failure because so many things. I feel like there's so many factors and so many things, and everyone has their own successes and their own failures, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it was really fun. It was really awesome, and uh, you know, I, th I think um, the importance of fun and action can't be overlooked because I feel like when you're having fun, it's really engaging to people walking around it, and I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, it's to be engaging and having fun and like yes we're disrupting business as usual and it's fun. <laughs> it, so. it, was, it was striking to me how joyful everything was uh, despite the mass arrests and everything else going on. It really, we, we hadn't done something like this and Mayday is the only comparison just months into making something this big. Uh, oh. the, the best description I've heard though uh, was from Sarah Jaffe who said that it was less a celebration of what was and more uh, displaying what Occupy has become. And in that way, I think it was something really interesting because 
it is this very different thing. Like we we can't get we haven't gotten tens of thousands of people like we necessarily did last fall. We don't have a twenty four seven occupation, but it's this very different thing. And I, I guess curiously, especially with people that are used to this old thing, do you feel like they're expecting something different in the uh, when you're covering it, or is there different ways to cover it, or did that play into um, your assessments? Uh, in my personal assessments, I figure like you know, Occupy has changed and evolved. You know, there's people who definitely are like, are like, what about you know this uh, permanent you know occupation? And I think it's definitely evolved. And for me, it, it was an mm -hmm. a success because I think it very clearly displayed. Um, you know, we have affinity groups now that come together for this big event and like organize and did you know did all this and um, I th and uh, yeah, I think it definitely shows what we built in a year and I think that's a, you know what's what's to come. And I talked to Lisa Fithian about this, who's and she was super excited. She's she's very excited about like <laughs> the potential of all these all these groups that are now formed and all this community that and infrastructure that has been formed and that's what it is right now and I think mm. it's beautiful. Couldn't agree more. And for anyone unaware as well, the, those affinity groups really was a different model of actions where we had the uh, swirl of roving intersection occupations where you just had on every different intersection across the financial district all these people leading autonomous actions, coordinating on Sally and, and all this other technology. Well, that's the thing. I don't think it, it's not a new model at all, affinity group actions. It's very new for Occupy, and I think it's very... You know, Occupy is only a year old, and it's a new community. And the fact that in a year there's already a community groups forming is a big deal. That have come together as cohesive groups to have this big action. I think you know, I mean, the, the model of affinity groups for action is absolutely not a new thing. You know, it's you know something that's you know pretty old in action actually. But but it's very new I, for Occupy. Well, I, I feel like the technology behind it, at least occupiers using the Selly loops that we were able to get so many people on and coordinating in that way, it was new for Occupy or an evolution for Occupy. Uh, and on that note, uh, Simumba, I obviously you've been focusing on OccuEvolve for a long time now. Uh, what do you take this direction that Occupy has been going, uh, and how do you assess S17? Oh, man, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> I thought that um, S17 overall was a success just in the fact that uh, we're still here, that we filled the parka, uh, uh, that we did have actions in the morning as well as afternoon and evening as well. Um, I think that the movement is, uh, or hope, uh, I'm between thinking and hoping that the movement is evolving. It looks like it's here to stay because the issues are, are still here. And, um, you know, in terms of the... Um, the actions like what we were involved in is Occupy and we're not a working group or an affinity group, we're an uh, independent group working with all the GAs in the city, there's seven GAs in the city. We're really focused on um, doing outreach. Uh, so what we did, uh, earlier we started the day with a teach-in and then uh, about the big banks um, and then we moved on to doing a, uh, a, a action of occupying the subway with Occupy Queen to actually get out the word to people that we're still here. This was our birthday or one-year anniversary. Um, so I, I think I'm hoping that's the direction that it goes because a lot of people still support Occupy Wall Street, uh, but they don't know that uh, some people don't know that we still exist. And I think that's where good people like Atik and yourself come in at, you know, by putting the media out there and us continually mm -hmm. doing that to let people know that we're still out here and how to plug in as well. Uh, occupying the subways was good for us because we not only told people just about Occupy Ball, but about Occupy Wall Street and how you can plug into the different working groups, uh, plug into the community-based uh, assemblies. Uh, we did we did about half a day of that, we, we, and people got tired. Uh, but I just think the fact, I guess media, I, I believe media is going to be the key of uh, communications and not just us talking amongst ourselves. Because the, the issues still exist, and... Um, and, uh, you know, so I feel like it was a success, a success, 180 arrests. I don't know if that's mass arrests or not, but, you know, um, I guess it's good. We don't have a general fund anymore, but as a result, but that's a whole other topic. So, 
let's move, let's move well, however you need to move on. <laughs> and what I think is interesting about what you're describing, what you do with uh, the occupations of the subways, as much media as there it has been about Occupy, it's amazing how much more there still is to learn and to do. And, and I have yet to have all the, the full background in terms of what that was like, getting organizing people the day of when ideally it should have been the peak awareness of people mm -hmm. around the city knew something big was coming with Occupy Wall Street. I, some of it, was it a different attitude, do you feel like, on S17? Were people aware of what was going mm -hmm. on or was it something different? I think uh, the people are aware of the issues that they face. The things we're talking about, you know, affects them directly across different classes as well. Um, are they aware of what Occupy Wall Street is doing? No. For the most part, I would say no. Uh, and the fact that we have, what, over, what is it, 90 groups listed, working groups listed, but like 40 that, 30 or 40 that are functioning. And that was really key for us to like, you know, this is how you get involved. And yes, we do stand for and against a lot of things, from fracking, you know, to getting money out of politics. But people want to know how they can plug in. People want to know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like we didn't, we put so much emphasis on the morning convergence and blocking or stopping whatever business that, you know, that the Wall Street was doing. But, you know, at the end of the day, you got to get the word out to the people and include the people as well. Mm -hmm. So that's always been kind of our issue. Like, actions are beautiful, but without outreach, without education, without plugging people in, I mean, it's just going to be us doing the actions and us getting arrested and us talking to one another. <laughs> and people are really, like, truly interested, you know, in what we're doing and, and making changes and having a pension at the end of the day and having a job and something to feed, you know, their family with. So, um, I, you know, it looks like it's good, and now we're kind of, and I don't want to jump too forward, too much forward, but now we're actually talking about the uh, November 6th national election. Mm -hmm. And there's a debriefing going on right now that's talking about that. So if, that, if something comes out of that, I think that would be really good for us as well. Agree, and I think the focus on outreach and the importance of that, it, as part and parcel of what we've seen with media, is, is the right perspective to have, and is that connecting point between the in-person and... I mean, broadcast, online, in print, what have you. But in exactly that spirit, uh, John, obviously you're an independent journalist who's been providing some of the best coverage of Occupy since early on. What was the NYPD's reaction to your efforts on S17, uh, trying to just spread the word and really just do your, not only your job, but your duty as a journalist? Uh, yeah, well, so their, their uh, reaction to me trying to do my job as a journalist was to throw me to the ground and arrest me. Um, I don't think that it was because I was a journalist or anything like that. Some people have said that, you know, it looks like it's a targeted <clears throat> arrest. I think that it's always better to presume uh, stupidity when we're talking about um, bad policing. Mm -hmm. as opposed to assume that there's some sort of grand plan and that, that they wanted to get me. I, I don't believe that for a minute. Um, but it's very similar to the the way that I was arrested on uh, December 12th, which was a, you know this similar situation. I was there. I was videotaping arrests. And uh, a cop, uh, a white shirt, said, um, you got press credentials. And... I said no, so he threw me to the ground, and they, you know, held me for uh, 37 hours that time. This time I was only held for about uh, four hours, uh, and you know, it's it's interesting because the guy who was arrested right next to me is a friend of mine, or not arrested, but uh, briefly detained right next to me, C.S. Muncie, who does have NYPD issued credentials. Um, he was let go. But when I was taken to the um, to to one police plaza, I had um, actually it was a WBAI uh, press pass around my neck on a lanyard. I don't do much work for them anymore, but um, I have it from before, and it it's clearly a press pass. Whether or not the NYPD recognizes it as such is sort of beyond the point to me. I couldn't care less what they think of my work or if they think I'm a real journalist. But we, when we got to 1PP, the the commander looked at it and he, he goes, so what are you, a journalist? And I said, yeah, I'm a journalist. And he said, but this is like, this is this is fake, right? You're, it's, not, it's not for real. 
And I was like, I'm a journalist, and beyond that, I'm going to stay quiet until I talk to my lawyer because mm -hmm. I didn't want to assert anything at all about you know whether this pass is real or not real or anything like that. But he knew that I was there to cover it and not um, to be a direct participant or or, or a you know as a, in an organizing capacity or something like that. Beyond all of that, I was just clearly on the on the sidewalk. So had they grabbed anyone in that case, it would have been completely inappropriate. Not just you know not mm -hmm. just me. They also they charged me with uh, blocking vehicular traffic, which is mm -hmm. really quite a trick considering I was where vehicles aren't supposed to go. Well, and also, as uh, the video that just came out today clearly shows, that you were very forcibly dragged from the sidewalk to the middle of the street where they technically were allowed to arrest anyone, I guess. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they you know, just grabbed me and dragged me into the middle of the street, and, mm -hmm. and that was it. So it seems like... As unfortunate, unfortunate's not even the right word, to have the NYPD making these assertions of who's a journalist, much less an independent journalist or someone who's charged with covering exactly this kind of situation, uh, it, this couldn't be appropriate in terms of them having these credentialed reporters and non-credentialed reporters and they just grab people and try to figure it out later? I mean, is that, have you heard of this happening anywhere else? Um, I guess I don't know uh, specifically about any other cities and any other uh, credentialing uh, processes. I mean, you know, towards the end of last year, you did hear about a lot of uh, journalists being arrested in Oakland, in Chicago, certainly. Um, you know, I witnessed that at the No NATO protest when I was there. Um, but as far as your sort of initial point of the absurdity of the NYPD, being able to confer status of journalist on someone. It couldn't be more absurd. They are the ones who need to be watched. And the idea that they uh, are the body that decides who is uh, a legitimate journalist and who is not a legitimate journalist is completely backwards. And, you know, I'm still sort of debating whether or not applying for uh, uh, an official press, press pass is worth it or not because... I feel like it legitimates the entire system to uh, to to um, recognize their monopoly on on that status, and it's it's totally absurd. I couldn't agree more about that. And on the other end of the spectrum, looking at how the movement not only has evolved but where we started, uh, Elizabeth clearly live streaming was as central to what we were doing from the beginning. Uh, but I, something somehow I doubt that you have a official press pass from the NYPD either. I don't. I do have. Uh, I have some press passes that were, you know, made, mm. but um, they're not. You know, it's it's interesting because I identify as tactical media and activist media, and I, I'm not like, you know, I, I came down to the park. You know, I'm a musician. I, I've never done media before going doing Occupy, and I, I came down as a musician, and I just saw that the the. I guess um, I had been watching live stream before coming down there, and I saw it as a powerful tool to tell a story that was being told. Because it was like mainstream media I was just saying. A lot of these things that I would go down to these events and be like, "This is a complete lie," and I was just like, "I'm going to start," you know. I, I identify as you know people's media, and I will go in and you know record things as an activist, I'm not you know trying to. I mean, I want to tell a story, uh, and I, and I you know I felt empowered to do that, you know, mm -hmm. being down at the park and being with all those wonderful people, and I think it's important, you know, when I say tactical media, I mean like I want to work with other people who are you know on the street with me doing this and. I'm hoping more people will feel empowered to take the media in their own hand, and you know, and anyone could be media. Anyone, I'm not doing anything special, and I want people to recognize that. And, be, and like, even like someone, I know for this S17, we were trying to build a network of people watching the streams and, and writing about it, hmm. and so that it was kind of a test run for for that for Global Rev, and it was interesting, and it needs more work. But I mean, anyone could be the media, the people's media, and tell a story, tell their story, and that's what we're trying to encourage them to do is like even if you want to post on your Facebook oh I saw this and like all your friends know and that's that's a form of media and um, I don't think people feel empowered enough to do it and so yeah no, exactly rant, rant. <laughs> no 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 and I, I think uh, I, I forget if it was exactly the case with John but I suspect, suspect it might have been but it when people are live streaming the whole time that's also it makes it so much easier to pick out like the points where there is something that's worth making that one or two minute YouTube clip of even. And once you have that clip of footage, you could put it on Facebook or Twitter or go mm -hmm. anywhere. It could end up on in mainstream media outlets even. 
And I don't know, I've heard that streaming was something I only really first started hearing about at the beginning of Occupy Wall Street. And I've heard the phrase, uh, streaming is the revolution. And it's something I think that's been really, it's changed my perception, at least, of what we're doing here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, for me, it's like such, a, it's such an immediate form of, of showing what's happening. In a, you know, visual is just so, such an impacting thing to see something happening. And even just seeing it, even if you're not there, and just you can write about it, talk about it, you know, if you see it. And it's, so, it's just so immediate. And like, also, your footage just saves to the internet immediately. So it's, you know, can't be taken away. So that's cool. Samumba, we were talking earlier, something really interesting that we had broached <laughs> in terms of outreach being this in-person form of media. And then we're assessing both S17 on the whole, but particularly S17 in this independent media world we've been developing. And well, how, how do you feel we, we did? S17, is it something that at least empowered people to want to go out, reach out more and to get more people into the movement? Do you feel like that this was something that we could springboard from? I think that it energized the people that were involved. Um, I haven't really talked to a lot of people that have been arrested. Um, as long as they aren't disheartened by their arrests, and I mean, everyone should have expected it if they were down in certain, you know, convergent zones. Um, so I think that, and I think they did see the power of the people in terms of the size of people at Liberty Park and some of the convergences later. So I think it was good for, like, some of our main troops there on the front line. Um, again, I just feel that there is a, a disconnect between what we're doing uh, down at Liberty and other places uh, between us and the 99% or what we call the 99%. Um, I think these actions are necessary, that they're good. Um, as important as the convergencies were and, um, and the different assemblies and events and actions happened that day, to me, I think the strongest part of S17 was, was us coming together at the end of the day and being at Liberty um, uh, Plaza and doing um, the popular assembly as well as doing various breakouts. Akubov had a great speak out um, and seeing the people there and the people that were walking by from the business, the business suits to the uh, tourists to see that we're still there and the fact that people do still see us there at Liberty. Um, I think is effective, but I think we're going to have to really start connecting um, direct action with outreach as well as education and also we have to be clear everybody can't do outreach because some people in our movement don't know how to talk to people you we have to reach people on a human level like the signs that we had why we occupy like they were pictures of people not only people of color but like women holding their their child or man kissing or a father kissing their daughter like people can immediately you know uh, connect with that, why we occupy. It's not just for us, it's more or less for the people that are coming before us and the people that uh, that are coming after us and in honor of those that came before us that struggle. So I think we have to really connect what we're doing, like really fundamental issues that are happening not only on Wall Street but on, but on, Main, on Main Street. Uh, but I will admit that there was, it was good to see some of the old older faces and people kind of coming back, and I guess we'll see in the next few weeks uh, the staying power of that. I, you know, I hate, I just my whole, my my main fear is that we get into this whole May Day thing. Like, okay, now May Day is over, so what do we? We're gonna wait now to the you know the next year anniversary, and then after that, are we gonna wait till the election, and then towards the next May Day? And so, me for me, the issue is when people put so much emphasis in these one day actions. When the fact of the matter is, we have the Spectre Pike flying thing happening now. We have uh, Occupy Barclays happening. We have, you know, so many actions, stop and frisk actions happening on a daily basis. My whole thing is for people to understand that this is a struggle, you know, that's gonna we're gonna be involved with for the rest of our lives. Mm. Some people can walk away, take a shower, get a haircut, and go right back to the lame street. Some of us are really going to be stuck in this matrix for a long time um, unless we fight to get out of it. So if, if so, for me, if this re-energizes the movement, and I think it has a potential to do that, I think that's probably probably the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think that that's really the, the the key point is that these days, these single days, should be seen as a kind of shot of adrenaline to people. Um, who have been doing a lot of kind of nitty gritty of organizing 
Uh, and so, you know, these days are a, a kind of public face and a way for people to get together and see each other again and kind of have that um, camaraderie again. But if, if uh, you adopt the kind of establishment media narrative of will uh, May Day revive Occupy Wall Street or will S-17, uh, you know, resuscitate Occupy Wall Street, those narratives are completely incorrect, and it's it, it, it. You need to you need to you know not buy into that framing, but instead think of S seventeen as a shot in the arm for the the kinds of things you know that, that we've been talking about. In addition to the worker collectives like Occupy, in addition to the legal um, working group Mutant Legal that's been doing a lot of good stuff. You know there are now four worker collectives that have sprung from the creative churn of Occupy Wall Street. And those are the kind of um, projects that I think are really exciting and inspiring. And they're also the kind of projects that uh, the establishment media is never going to talk about. And so one way to get them into the news, I think, is to have these, these large days, or just to get the, you know, to get the, the message into the news is to have these uh, large days like that, but I totally uh, agree that that if we if you buy into a today is make or break, then it's never going to feel like it was a total victory. So you just can't think about it in those kinds of terms because it is it's going to be you know decades. Well, let me can I interject right quick? I just want to say that mm -hmm. What what frightens me is like I've heard I heard people at the Occu picnic that, that Occupy Story Long Island City sponsored. Uh, what was that in July? People saying the only thing we're focusing on at this point is um, is the S seventeen convergence, you know. And what I worry about is people on the inside of our movement continually focusing on these one day actions and convergences, thinking that that's going to be the revolution and people are going to automatically wake up and things of that nature. The media is, the lamestream media is always going to frame it, you know, as days, you know, as, you know, make or break. But I'm worrying about the people inside of our movement that think that these one-day actions are going to re-spark our movement. And the fact is they, they aren't unless we do the outreach, um, unless we, you know, have good people like the T uh, putting out the message and people are really responding to the messages of uh, Occupy Wall Street. It's a continual struggle. We may not, you know, see the fruits uh, that we uh, plant the tree. We plant the tree, we may not see the fruits that bear from it. Um, but I'm hoping just, just within that we recognize that this struggle is a lifelong struggle. We're only one year in. That's another thing that we have to keep in perspective. It took the Civil Rights Movement eight years to get a major law passed, it took an anti-Vietnam War movement eight years in that war, to help in that war. So I think that's one thing we have to realize, and when we actually talk to the lamestream media, that we have to also point that out, continually point that out, and also point that out to people. We've only been here a year, and we're growing and hopefully evolving in ways that will help our movement grow and bring true change to America and the world. <laughs> Elizabeth, any closing thoughts in that vein? Yeah, I mean, um... I think, uh, yeah, I feel like the, the issues we're trying to tackle are like things that affect us every day, but we also have to acknowledge that there's people that can't be in the streets every day for whatever reason, and that's a real thing. Uh, you know, it's a privilege to be able to be in the streets every day, and that's, you know, something to recognize, and I feel like these these big days are important for people to feel re-energized, and I don't think it's an end, I think looking at it an end-all, be-all is definitely not the right path. I think I look at it as like a test run for well, how we can improve different things that we're doing, like, and it also um, a test run for how our infrastructure is doing it, and an opportunity to build the infrastructure even more, and I think, you know, the affinity groups, I think, really kind of took on a form at this, in this action, and I think that was... Uh, important and uh, as as media, I mean, we came together. People who've been working every day for months, and now we came together for this day to try to put, you know, a message together. And yeah, it's not perfect. Yeah, you know, we're also trying to, you know, defeat the mainstream media that's had mm -hmm. infrastructure built for they have tons and tons of decades on us, you know, and uh, we, we don't have a lot of money. yeah, <laughs> and a lot of money, and so we don't have either of those. And so uh, this was definitely a good, you know, test of tactics that if you want to call it of you know using media in a tactical way and 
I think that now there's a big action day in uh, Spain uh, tomorrow. They're going to try to take over Congress. And so we're, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in North Dakota, but I'm going to try to, you know, write about it and, you know, tweet about it and make sure that I, I create media out of it for the people who are on the ground. So that's, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think all these are examples, as Sarah Jaffe said, I'll quote again, that this was, S17 is about showing what Occupy has become. And I think also uh, Alison Kilkenny wrote in The Nation saying that Occupy Wall Street was never going to impress the mainstream media, so we didn't try to. And I think that regardless of how the mainstream media covered us, I think everyone on this Hangout has really displayed the success of this model, at least in terms of not having to rely on this broadcast media that isn't going to give us this fair shake, and where we're able to have shows like this on Occupy Public Access TV. And I believe with that, though, we are just about out of time for this episode. So I believe we should end it there, and hopefully we'll have, be able to continue this and further additions. Today on our show, we have special guest Paul Houghton, who's a regular crew member on Occupy Brooklyn TV. He had his first Occupy experience shooting the events of S17 and would like to share with us his impressions. Up until now, I have been strictly a studio member of Occupy Brooklyn TV. As an outsider, I wasn't sure what the Occupy group was all about. Were they hippies, leftists, a grassroots organization? I didn't know. I listened, I watched, I learned, and I am still learning. I walked with occupiers on S17 and I saw the looks of dismay and separation, us and them. Voices of, we're with you, good luck, and beat it. The strength of institutions, cops, and the business as usual standard. The news only told you of the arrests, not the issues. They don't remind you that we are all Americans. The movement seems erratic and wacky, but it must go on. I am for truths to be told and information to be brought forth. I can tell you the occupiers are not leftists or lost souls. They are members of every group. It is not a gang or a tribe, but real people a loving and close-knit people. It is a group of true believers who believe things must change. In the Declaration of Independence, it says, quote, accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed to, end quote. If humanity does not right itself, who will? Revolution, or evolution, as I like to call it, is about involvement. The only thing missing in this one is you. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. And this is People's TV, so get in touch. Let us know what you think of the show, and let us know how you'd like to get involved. The number is 646-580-8446, or you can send us an email at info at occupypublicaccesstv.com. See you next week.